This is my fourth video that looks at using the BeagleBone as a development platform for embedded applications. The previous videos introduced to the board looked at setting up a C, C++ development toolchain and the last one looked at programming the GPIOs. This video builds on those three videos to look at how we can interface the BeagleBone to I2C devices. There's a huge range of I2C devices available and understanding this bus really improves the capability or range of applications that we can develop with the BeagleBone or indeed any embedded system. In this video I'm going to look at the Bosch BMA180 which is an accelerometer or to be precise a digital triaxial acceleration sensor. The BMA180 is tiny, about 3mm squared and it's less than about 1mm high. It's a sensor that is in a 12-pin LGA package. I don't have the tools to work with this sensor in this form, but thankfully Sparkfund supply a breakout board for this sensor with the device already in place. It costs about 30 US dollars and has the external components such as the blocking capacitor in place. The other reason that I've chosen this board is because it works at 3.3 volts, and as a result I don't need to add any bidirectional level converters. The BMA180 uses MEMS technology, which stands for Micro Electromechanical Systems. These are systems that are between 1 and 100 micrometers in size, so up to about one tenth of a millimeter, where they consist of physical sensing devices and some type of microprocessor connected together. The BMA180 senses acceleration on three axes, and it has seven configurable G ranges from plus minus 1G to plus minus 16G. It senses temperature for internal temperature compensation and it makes these values available as well. The four sensors are analog sensors where they're converted from analog to digital using a 14-bit ATD converter. There's a digital block also that can filter the data on board using 10 different selectable filters. And on the right hand side you can see that there's a facility for I2C or SPI output and that there's also a user configurable interrupt possible as well. In this video I'm going to look at how we can attach a device to the I2C bus and how we can build a program that runs on embedded Linux and can read or write to that device. I've built an application using Qt uh, or Qt that runs on my PC that acts as a server that receives data from the BeagleBone which is acting as a client machine. The BeagleBone reads the sensor values from the BMA180 registers and packages the values into XML blocks that are sent using network sockets. You can see that even though I'm doing quite a bit of processing that the response to change on the server side is almost immediate. In this video I'm going to concentrate on the I2C part of this application. I'm going to look at how we can read or write from the I2C bus and I'm just going to use the BMA180 as an example. So what is the I2C bus? Well, it's a simple bus that was designed by Philips in the 1980s to allow communication between devices on the same PCB. I2C means inter-IC or IIC, so that's where the I2C name comes from. Since the late 90s, the bus has had a high speed of up to 5 megabits per second in ultra-fast mode. The nice features of the I2C bus are There are only two lines required, one for serial data, which is labelled SDA, and one for serial clock, which is labeled SCL. The clock is used for synchronization. Each device can be a master or a slave, where the master generates the clock signal, and so the data rate is quite flexible. A simple master-slave relationship exists at all times. Each device attached to the bus can have a unique address, which is either a 7-bit or a 10-bit number. You'll see later that when we probe the bus for devices, will only probe in the range of 0, 0 hex to 0 by 80 hex as we're using 7-bit addressing. It is a true multi-master bus where there are facilities for collision detection and arbitration to prevent data corruption if two or more masters simultaneously initiate data transfer. And finally, there is on-chip noise filtering built in. The best source of detailed documentation on the I2C bus is the I2C specification that's available from NXP Semiconductors, which is a company that was founded by Philips. This link is provided in the YouTube video description. Here is a diagram of the configuration that is used in this application. The BeagleBone is the master and the BMA180 is the slave device. The two devices share a common ground and a 3.3 volt supply. 
so there are only two wires required for communication. The Beagle bonus master initiates a data transfer, generates the clock signals and terminates the transfer. The BMA 180 as a slave is addressed by the master. Synchronization is the name of the procedure to synchronize the clock signals and the two devices using the SCL line. Once synchronized, data can be sent over the SDA line as required. The SDA and SCL are bidirectional lines, which are connected to the positive supply by pull-up resistors. This means that when the bus is free, both lines are high. You can see that the outputs in this figure are open drain. This means that the voltages are not fixed and so we can mix different logic families and we can add any number of devices. Well, depending on the inherent wire capacitance. This wire capacitance and the termination resistor or P affects the temporal behavior of the signals on SDA and SCL and ultimately the communication speed. The RP value usually ranges from 1 kilo ohm to 10 kilo ohm. Also, the SCL and SDA signals must be sampled by Schmidt trigger inputs to build in some degree of hysteresis. One of the features that is available due to this open drain configuration is clock stretching. A slave device can hold the clock line low after sending or receiving a byte, indicating that it's not ready to process more data. The master cannot finish the transmission of the current bit and must wait until the clock line goes high. If the slave is clock stretching, the clock line will still be low because the connections are open drain. I'm going to wire my circuit in this example as shown in the figure. I'm pulling the power and 3.3 volt supply from the beagle bone, but after that I only need the serial clock and serial data lines. In this example I'm using the third I2C bus which is labelled I2C2 and I'm using pins 19 which is I2C2 underscore SCL and pins 20 which is I2C2 underscore SDA on the P9 header. The wiring of the sensor is then decided from the data sheet. There are 8 inputs where I'm not using the interrupt so only 7 are connected. These are the supply, ground, SCK which is the I2C clock. SDI which is the I2C data line. Then there is a second connection to the supply for VIO and to the CS input to choose I2C instead of SPI. Finally I have also grounded SDO which is the last bit of the address. So this sets the address to be 40 hex of this slave device the BMA180 rather than 41 hex if I set it high. I'm going to use the I squared C tools on my beagle bone. So the first thing I'm going to do is connect to my beagle bone. It's at that IP address, log into my beagle bone. Uh, and in this case, I'm using Linux 3.2.0. It's a Ubuntu um, build that I have myself. But the steps are pretty much the same, whether you're using Ubuntu or Angstrom, it, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to begin by accessing and using the I squared C bus using the I squared C tools. It, this is a Linux package that allows us to probe the bus and to access devices that are attached to the bus. The first thing we have to do is make sure we have the tools. So we would do this by say sudo apt get update to, uh, in this case, update the package index on the, on the BeagleBomb, just to make sure that I have the most up-to-date version of the packages. So it goes through an update and I think Okay, so that's finished. Um, so we've updated the list of packages. We could just search this. We can do apt cache uh, search uh, I2C, for example. And we can see there's a list of packages that mention I2C. The one we want is the very first one. It's a heterogeneous set of I2C tools for Linux. Now, I have this installed, but just, just to show you the step, sudo apt get install. I2C tools. Let's make sure I put the most up-to-date version. So I already have the newest version, so I'm all up to date. But that's the way that you can install these tools. So the first, the first tool that I'm going to use is I2C detect. Uh, D E T E C T, and you can see that this is the the information it gives. It's a Linux user space program to scan an I squared C bus for devices. Uh, so we can use this by typing. I2C detect minus L to probe um, the um, beagle bone. 
So this lists the ice support C buses that are available on the BeagleBone. I've made a slight modification to the setup of my BeagleBone to enable the I2C2 bus. So I think it's hidden to allow for the uh, creation of capes, but if you do need access to a third I2C bus, it is possible to enable I2C2. So we can also then find out the functionality of uh, our, our, our bus. So we can do something like this, we can say, so we can display the functionalities of each adapter using, let's say, sudo, sudo uh, i2c detect uh, minus f. So we'll just detect on the, and this is the first i squared c adapter. And we can see, for example, that there's a full support for SMB bu SM bus. Okay. So the i squared c bus and SM bus are essentially compatible with each other. So normally devices that are either master or, or slaves and they're interchangeable between both buses. That's why you see SM bus uh, functionality here when you, when you probe uh, this particular adapter. So you can see down here that this bus supports I, I2C block write and I2C block read. Uh, essentially this allows us to read or write a block of 32 bytes from or to a device and it's quite e efficient. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to um, look to detect a list of devices that are on a particular bus. So I, in this case, I'm going to probe the third I squared C bus, where at the moment I have no uh, devices attached. So I can do this by typing sudo i2c detect minus or uh, tree, oh, tree. And it gives me a warning here. This program can confuse your I2C bus, cause loss of data and worse. That's pretty ominous. Uh, it's gonna probe this particular file and read the commands. And it's probing in the range of zero by zero three to zero by 77. So we'll continue, yes. Okay, so here you can see the typical output that we get. Uh, when you see that there's a minus minus, uh, this means that the address was probed and no um, chip answered. So there's no device at this particular address. Um, you can see UU, it means the probing was skipped at this particular location. And this is probably because the address is currently in use by a driver. So it could suggest that there's a chip at the address or that the chip, the particular address is just not available because of the physical set, set up. If you see an address number, then a chip was found at that address. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a slight modification to my setup. Um, so I'm going to plug in uh, a couple of my wire so that I've attached the accelerometer now to the device. So I'm going to probe the third I squared C bus again, um, where I've attached the accelerator, the sorry, accelerometer to pins 19 and 20 on the P9 header. So pin 19 is on the on the P9 headers I squared I two C two SCL. So that's the clock of the third I squared C bus which is I2C2, because they go I2C0, I2C1, I2C2. And pin 20 on the P9 header is I2C2 SDA. So this is the data line. So we've got the clock and the data line. I've also used pin one for the ground and pin three, which is the VDD3V3EXP. And that's because I'm powering this accelerometer using a 3.3 voltage supply. So I'm gonna do the same call again. So you see in this case here, we had these, um, the only thing that was found here were these UU values again, because these were currently in use. Uh, but now that I've connected my accelerometer, you, can, you should see a change. So agree to it this time. You can see that in this case, we had minus minus, so there was nothing attached there. But now in this case, the address is displayed. So this shows us four zero, which means that I have some sort of device attached at location four zero, because this is the address. If you look at the, the cross reference here, this is four zero. Um, so that would be four zero, four one, four two, four three, four four in hexadecimal. These are hexadecimal values up to F. Okay, so this means that there's a device now attached to the location zero by four zero, if you like. Um, the BM a180 accelerometer sensor has two selectable addresses on the i squared c bus so it's either 0 by 40 or 0 by 41 depending on how you wire it or configure it so i've wired it to choose 0 by 40 by connecting the sdo input to vss if you wanted to get 41h uh, the hexadecimal value 41 so if you wanted the device to appear here you connect the sdo input to VDDIO. And that's a useful feature because if you had two devices that were potentially had the same address, 
they would clash and you couldn't connect them to the same I squared C bus. Um, it also allows you to connect six of these devices to the BeagleBone. You could have it connected to um, 40 and 401 on, on the three buses and have six of these accelerometers on the same on the same BeagleBone. Uh, there is something else we can do as well. We can also go, before I start probing this, looking at to read values on this particular device, at least we can see at the moment that the device has appeared. Um, we can actually go and look at the device itself. So to do this, we go cd slash sys and devices platform. Uh, and we want to go into OMAP. Okay. And we're looking at I2C3. So the um, three, I think it is. Okay, so we're in order. So here you can see that we've got our our. Um, uh, let's go into this. I two. Okay, so we're in into I two C three, and here you can see that we have the currently connected devices. So this is. Um, th these were the values that were previously marked with UU and probing was skipped. Um, so you can see that the values are 0, 0, 54, 55, 56 and 57. I don't know, can I scroll back up? I can't. 50, uh, 4, 5, 6 and 7. So there were the devices that were, were skipped. So you can see that they're actually, they're, they're, they're allocated here in, in this um, configuration. It is possible for us to map a device to the beagle bone and we could do this if we had to develop a driver for example i'm not going to really cover that in this video or in this application because i want to do everything in user space but if for some reason you wanted to develop or work in kernel space you could do something like this you could go uh, sudo h we have to go into our shell and we could do this we could say echo I'll just do an ls just to make sure we're all in order so we've got um, a call to new device so we could say something like this. We could say echo BMA 180 uh, by 40 was the address to uh, new device. Okay. So here we can see now that we've got three, uh, I squared C bus three, zero, zero, four, zero is, is the address. Uh, so we can go into this if we like. And we can see, for example, cat name. So if you were developing a driver, you could associate BMA 180 as the driver for this particular device. Um, we're not going to do this, but just I just wanted to show you that it was possible. So I want to delete this device so I can echo zero by uh, 40 is the address um, to delete device. So delete device is there. It's a, I can write to that. Uh, so 3040 was there, so we can go. Yeah, so it's gone. So 3040 has gone. So we've deleted that device just to be clear. And I'm just going to exit from this uh, super user shell just to um, make it clear that I'm away from that. Okay, so I'm going to CD um, to my home directory just to be clear that now I'm just continuing to use the I squared C tools. So let's look at reading values from the I squared C device. So um, we can do this by type, typing using I2C dump. Okay, so there's I2C dump. Uh, we have to pass it, there's options here. We have to pass it the I squared C bus and the address of the device on the I squared C bus. So we want to go to uh, bus three and the address is zero by 40. And then we have, a, we have a choice of how we want to receive the particular block of data. So we can do this by typing, for example, sudo uh, I2C dump three and uh, zero by 40. And I'm just gonna go for default options, press, Oh, it's going to probe my device, could possibly damage it and so on. Everything's okay. I'm, I, I don't have anything else. I'm not using anything else. So now I've probed the device and you can see here are the registers on the device. So this is a full data dump from the BMA 180 sensor. Page 21 of the data sheet of the BMA 180 sensor explains what all these addresses, what all these registers are. So you can see, for example, 000, zero, zero. if you look at the at the data sheet and you look at the value that's here we get the value zero by uh, zero three and this is the chip id of the particular chip and in this particular location we have the version so this is chip id three version 14 
Um, and they'll say the same every time I probe the device. So if I, if I call the device again, um, uh, you'll see that those values 3 and 14 have remained exactly the same. The next few registers are the accelerometer X, Y, Z and temperature values. So they are between uh, this location here, so 0, 2 and 0, 8. So they're in pairs, if you like. The first one is the X, the first pair is the X acceleration, the Y acceleration, the Z acceleration and the temperature. There's a, an internal temp temperature compensation. So the temperature value is also made available so that you can read it. Uh, you'll notice that there, that, that says E1, FA, F1. If you'll notice that every time I read it, um, E1, FA, F1, you'll see that it's changed. Uh, e, A, uh, F1, uh, 21, so just look, compare. You can see that that has changed. So E1, FA, F1. So you can see that there's changes in the device, at least the, the value is changing. So something, that's, a good, that's good news because it means that uh, moving the sensors having an effect on the on the value that's uh, been received in the registers. Um, you'll notice that it goes on for quite a bit. You can see between 0, 0 and you'll notice that the upper value here is 7E. Now, if you look at the data sheet, you can see that um, the registers that are accessible from the device are between 0, 0 and 0 by 5B. So 5B, um, 5B... 5B, where's that? 5B, that's the upper bound in terms of the useful registers. There's then reserved information that the sensor uses internally between that location and I think the upper bound is, uh, I, think it's 8, I think it's 8F. So between there and 8F. So that, that's all reserved data. It, it, I'm sure it's diagnostic data for, for Bosch when they're uh, debugging or or, or calibrating these ICs. So this is this, this, this all these registers are accessible directly from uh, directly from user space and it allows us to configure the device to choose the ranges for the accelerometer ranging values, the threshold, set up interrupts, read values, there's even space there for storing values. So there's it's quite a comprehensive um, data sheet with quite a number of pages. Okay, so that's that's how we can sort of do a data dump of the of the uh, device. If we wanted to read a particular value, so let's look at say we wanted to write a script at the command line, and we wanted to read this value in here from from directly from the chip on the bus. We can use um, a command called i2c get again as part of the i2c tools. So this requires i2c get uh, the the bus and the chip address and then the data address that we want to read from. So we can do this by saying, for example, sudo uh, i2c get. Um, minus y is a, is a handy option. It just says, rather than having to say yes every time, you can just use minus y. And we're on the third bus. Uh, the device is 0 by 40. And we want to read in 0, 0. So the, the very first value at, at 0, 0. And you remember, that was, that was the number 0, 3, the chip ID. So there we get our value back, 0 by 0, 3. So that's the chip ID. If you remember, the next value, 0, 1, was the version. So that's 0 by 14. Say we wanted to read in the uh, most significant bit of the accelerometer. Well, we can type that by, if we look up the data sheet, we can see that that's actually um, address 3. Okay. So this returns 0 by FB. That's the most significant bit, but it's it's kind of slightly complicated. That's bits six to thirteen of the of the number. It's a fourteen bit number, and there's bit six to thirteen. The least significant bit has six bits. Um, that's because two of the eight bits are being used to tell you if there is a new value present, and then the overall number when you combine the most significant bit and the least significant bit together is in two's complement. Um, so that means that you have the possibility of negative and positive acceler acceler accelerometer values on the x-axis. And that, that makes sense if you rotate to you know, left or right, for example, um, you will get negative or positive values. You can also set values on, on this particular device. You could say, for example, I2C set, uh, oop, I2C set, and this allows you to set a value at a particular address. So for example, you could type I2C set minus Y, 3 is the bus number, uh, 0 by, by 4, 0, and then we might want to write the number 255 uh, to the device. I don't want to do this at the moment, so that would write the value 255 to the device at address 0 by 40 on the I2C bus 3. 
I don't want to do this because the values that you write to set that on the EMA 180 are very carefully constructed. They're either two's complement values or some of the bits within a byte mean something different than the other bits. So I'll explain how to do this in the next section when I look at interacting with the I squared C device using a C C++ application. This is an example of my accelerometer and I've built an application here just to test this using Qt or Qt. Um, it's the Nokia development platform that sits on top of C++ for Linux, Unix, Mac, uh, everything. It's a great development environment. So I've built an application on my on my PC for this. Here's my, my BeagleBone and I've, I've built an application here that's running on the embedded system that's sending that data over the network sockets. So this application simply reads the accelerator, accelerometer values from the accelerometer and passes them over a network as network data where the Qt application, Qt application is reading that data and displaying it. So to run this robot platform application, I'm just going to uh, execute here, sudo um, dot slash robot platform. So that executes here. And then just pull up my Qt application. This is on my PC. You can see here it's running away and you can see that uh, the data, it's not bad that the axis here on the Y axis is the acceleration value. So that sh at the moment should be between plus and minus one G. So at the moment, the, um, the sensors resting on the, on the breadboard. So you can see it's quite noisy, but it's within a very, very specific range. Uh, we could low pass filter this, but that then would cause delays in terms of how interactive our application is. So for example, if I start to rotate this, now I'm gonna rotate it around the Y axis. You can see that uh, if we rotate it about 90 degrees, you can see that we're now having an acceleration of one against the, um, against in this case, the red, uh, sorry, the blue with the Y axis. So let's rotate around the Y axis. If I rotate it in the opposite direction down to, 90 degrees in the opposite direction, we've an acceler acceleration value of about minus one uh, around the y-axis. Uh, if we rotate in x, you can see we're rotating down. Uh, again, uh, that's minus one in the, in this case, in the x-axis, and then plus one in, in the x-axis. So you can see that it, it's a, it's quite an accurate sensor. It has, it, it, it works very quickly. If I give it a shake, you can see um, it's a very, very quick feedback if I rotate it and, and move it. And that's even if you consider I'm parsing up the data as an XML stream and sending it over the network. So there's a lot of processing going on and there's no issue in, in, in it handling the load. Um, the next stage if, to improve, to remove the jitter or the, the shakiness of the data will be to um, integrate using sensor fusion, a gyroscope. Uh, and use the gyroscope to filter the accelerate, accelerometer data. Uh, but this, this works very well and you can see, see the effect here. If I leave it sit for a second, this graph here that I'm using, it's a QT widget, um, it's auto ranging. So you'll see that it, the, it auto ranges on the Y axis according to the data stream. So again, you can see that the noise is contained within point uh, plus minus 0 0.15 of a G. So it's, it's, it's quite good and it will be easy to filter this down somewhat. <clears throat> um, over here, I just have a visualization just to map. So you can see here, the rotation is representative of the application. Again, this is a, a standard OpenGL widget. I'm using OpenGL, which is a 3D rendering engine. And OpenGL is just drawing this and, and keeping the cogs spinning. I'm just, the reason for this is I'm just testing that it's treaded. And down here, I've got a few sliders and these are set for plus minus 180 degrees. So you can see I, as I move them, they're just giving me uh, feedback. At the moment, I've turned off the Z, uh, rotation in Z, because rotation in Z is, 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 is different than what I expected. So rotation in Z is really if you, if you orient the sensor this way and then start rotating, then you're rotating, the, the Z kicks in and, and it becomes useful. So it's really if you've um, changed the, I suppose, the frame of reference. Okay, I'm going to run the same application again, and this time I'm going to um, include the z-axis. So here you can see, just call up the application. Again, you can see we have the same same sort of effects. I have auto-ranging set for x and y, uh, but not for z. So here, the rotation, let's have a look at rotating in 
uh, again you can see the rotation in in this case I'm rotating around the y-axis and blue is the y-axis rotate around Z and you can see we've got full rotation in Z sorry in in X the the z-axis if we look at the value from the z-axis really if we rotate the sensor here now the z-axis is at zero and if i if, if i rotate if i rotate z you see z is rotating around this direction so it's really about orientation so now we're rotating in z and you can see the z value is changing i just have to get the range i have an auto range on z so you can see we're getting the full range on z now at the moment i've I have the Z, so when we sit it this way, Z is actually sitting at minus 1G. So flat, Z is at minus 1G. Finally, I just want to show you uh, an example of if you were to, for example, knock the table. So I'm just going to bang the table. You can see here that it's quite distinct in terms of detecting uh, knocks or impulses. Um, and it's, it's quite good it's quite fast reaction as well uh, in detecting those values so it's a very useful sensor as I said um, for sensor fusion there, there is quite a bit of noise or jitter uh, it reacts it, it it doesn't have a sort of an accumulated error so it's you know once I rest it back it goes back to zero there's no accumulated error like you get with a gyroscope okay so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to build a C++ application that interacts with the registers on the sensor. To do this, I have my development environment, which is in a virtual host within my uh, PC. And I'm cross compiling here directly to my BeagleBone. And I explained this in the previous video uh, where I set up my development environment for cross compilation. So please look at that video first if you, if you want to understand how I've set up this development environment using CDT uh, on Eclipse. Okay, so to build this uh, interact, so the mechanism for interacting with the sensor, I need two things. First of all, I need my development environment, and the next thing I need is my data sheet. And data sheet for the BMA 180, it's it's not too bad. There are some things now that I found were were difficult to understand, especially the temperature values, and and there were a few other funny things about reading and writing. Um. But the full data sheet is there and it gives good information about the features of the, uh, the BMA 180. Uh, and there's one thing in particular that we need, if I just get down to it, well, we need to know, understand first of all, what these acceleration ranges are and so on, and the sensitivity ranges and so on, but not, okay, let me get down to the one that's most important to me. Um, well, this one's kind of important. This is the set of filters low G, high G interrupts. I haven't implemented the interrupts. Um, but the one that's most important is this, the global memory map. And this shows the registers in effect. And I'm going to start off by explaining, let's see if I can get a little bit closer to the ones down at the bottom. I'm going to start off at the bottom, which is where the most important values are. Um, this shows the eight bits of each byte. And it shows, uh, this is our 0, 0 value, 0, 1, 0, 2, and so on. So it shows how these values are laid out. And this is the, the values I discussed earlier. The chip ID, the version, the acceleration, X, LSB, the least significant bit, most significant bit of X. Then you've got your Y pair, your Z pair, and the temperature. So there's other values here as well. Uh, I have implemented some code to work with some of these registers and actually to write to some of these registers. And I'll make all of this code available and linked from the YouTube video index. Um, now, it's not perfect. It's only a partial implementation of this sensor, but it should give you an example of how you would implement um, code to work with, with any sensor. So this is just an example of a sensor that you might interact with with the I2C bus. So I'll just leave that there and go back to my code. So the code itself, now that I've written it, I've tried to decide, design it using C++ to make it as simple as possible to use. So the way that I've done this is I've created a class called BMA180 Accelerometer. And you create an accelerator, accelerometer object, you pass it the um, I2C bus, and then it's a dress on the I2C bus. So we're using I2C bus 3, and the device ID is, uh, is 40 in hexadecimal. Whenever we use 0 by 
40 or anything like that in C++ or C, we're talking about a hexadecimal value. Once we do that, I've got certain functions that I've, I've made public from the BMA 180 accelerometer class. And these are get bandwidth, get mode config, get range, get temperature, get acceleration X, get acceleration Y, get acceleration Z, and so on. I also have this other one, which is read full sensor state. And this is because I found that the most robust way to read the values from the, um, the accelerometer was to read the entire um, contents of all the registers into a, a temporary state. I found this is much more stable because of the fact that when you read using this particular device, when you read, it starts the next time you try to read again, it starts from the location after the last location you've read. So it can become, uh, it's possible that you can end up with an offset. So the idea is that in this case here, we're, we're reading in the, we're setting up the accelerometer on this bus and then we read the value. So I'm just gonna show you first of all that this works. So project uh, build all. So it's building it and we're getting our full application. Now it's build with no errors, as you'd expect. I've just set it up. Uh, and then I'm going to copy my uh, um, my application and paste. Okay, overwrite. So I have my, my, my value there. So I'll go in here and I'll execute this. So I'm in that directory. This is, sorry, this is my, this is my um, shell, my secure shell onto my BeagleBone. So you can see I'm on my, my BeagleBone on map. And I can execute this by typing sudo dot slash robot platform. Okay. I think I got the password wrong. Try again. Okay, so it executes. So you can see that just to check that this is working correctly, x is minus 3. So I'm just going to rotate the sensor around the uh, x axis and execute again. And you can see that as I rotate it around the x axis, try again. Uh, I have it now at 90 degrees. If I rotate it in the opposite direction, you can see that it's, I've got a value in the opposite direction. So this is reading in the values directly from um, the, the beagle bone. The temperature value has also been ready. And I, I found it's it's stable, but it's it's only okay. Um, um, it, it's, it's about right at that value. It seems a little bit high. It's a bit colder in here at the moment. But anyway, the other values are read in. The bandwidth is, is four, mode is zero, range is two, and so on. I'll, I'll explain those values uh, shortly. So that's the way that you interact with this class now it's written. So that's the reason I've wrapped it up as a C++ class, just to make it easy um, to decide what parts should be publicly accessible, what parts should be privately accessible. The way I've built the code to talk, I'm using sysfs like before, and I'm using the simple gpo.h um, file or, or class that I use, or well, it's actually, it's, it's not a class, it's a set of functions that I've um, used in the previous video on the GPIO um, example. And then in, in that video, I discussed all of these functions, export, unexport, open, close, and so on. I just added one extra one in, which is GPIO OMAP MUX setup. And this just allows me to set up a particular the MUX settings on a particular pin, just to say that a pin is a GPIO pin or, or decide what it is. That's the only thing I've changed, but everything else is the same. So the only thing really here I have to talk about is this partic these, these two files here, the BMA180, the C++ uh, header, and also the implementation. So I'm just gonna give a quick scan of this. As I said, I'm making the code available, so I don't want to go through everything. Um, that's my C++ file, so let's start with the header file. Okay, so the first thing I did was I set up all of these um, enumerations. And the reason I set up these enumerations is these are, for example, the this is the bandwidth setup and this is the, the, G, the G range setup. So I've enumerated a set of values against it, this, these range settings that align with the data sheet values. And the reason I've done that is because it makes the code much easier and it means that it's not, it's not possible to set up uh, or, or to input in an invalid value. So these enumerations are called BMA 180 range, bandwidth and mode config. And, and these are the options in this case. Um, if I go to the data sheet, I'll just go zoom out a bit just to I can get, find out where I'm going. Um, let me see if I can find one of them just to show you. 
uh, here for example is the bandwidth so you can see that these the values that I've set align with this um, so the bandwidth is um, there we go there's the bandwidth here and there's the bandwidth in the table so you can see the enumeration I've enumerated with with numbers at the side just to be absolutely certain that I've enumerated it correctly you can see here uh, 10 Hertz bandwidth is equal to 0, 0, 0, 0. so it's the number 0 that's my 10 right up to my 1001 which is my band pass which is 9 8 plus 1 is 9 so these this enumeration just aligns directly with the data sheet and what's in the data sheet okay then down into the rest of my class I have my uh, acceleration my temporary values I've got my temporary values the private values for my all of these states and I've got functions now let me see what's important here uh, convert acceleration is important that's how it takes the most significant bit and the least significant bit and combines it into a single acceleration integral value uh, I have a right I squared C divide and maybe let's have a look at the read full sensor state so I'll go in and look at that so these are my functions that I've made public the constructor my display mode that's not really used my read full sensor state which reads all of the values all of the registers in in one go my set range and set modes and get temperature, get acceleration value. So let's have a look at the read full sensor state first of all. Um, the other thing I have too is here is, the, is a, a set of definitions that align with the registers themselves. So I showed you earlier the registers and we saw that the least, least significant bit for accelerometer for, for the X accelerometer is 0, 2 and three so these are the I've just assigned a set of, of constants if you like against these so that I can be sure uh, that I'm using them correctly so here's the constructor of my uh, class you can see that it simply takes the two values and sets them to the states and also calls the read full sensor state which is good to go on to this next uh, the read full sensor state function um, takes in and sets up it, it, it sets up the um, the value that we're going to read from which is we want i squared c3 to come in here so the 3 comes in as the bus and it gets sent here so that we open this file uh, read write for read writing at the particular bus so if we can't if we can't open the bus then we get an error the next thing we do is we want to actually address the slave device which is 0 by 40 so the 0 by 40 comes in here and we use ioctl um, to to access that Okay, once we get this in place I do this thing here which is quite odd um, and it's it's quite a strange thing but hidden away in the data sheet of the BMA 180 page 59 which is quite a bit in you need to send the first address in write mode and then a stop start bit condition is issued data bytes are transferred with automatic address increment now I found that to be to get the most consistent behavior out of this center I was finding I was having problems I had to actually pretend to write to zero by zero zero, which set the counter, the, the, the sort of the offset back to zero zero and meant that now we can read from that location. If you leave this section out and you have um, a sort of a, a random reader write, you can end up reading the buffer from one after that random reader write. And that seems to be a feature of this sensor. Uh, the number of bytes is the number of bytes we want to read in from the buffer, uh, which is 80 in this case. And we read them all in if we don't succeed or we don't get 80 uh, hexadecimal 80 bytes read in. Well, then we, we, we say there's a major problem. Also, I have this secondary check here just to make sure that my, I have data consistency. Since the, um, remember, if you remember the device ID was 03, if the first byte is not 0 of 3, well then I know there's a problem and that I have a major failure that my BMA180 has lost synchronization. Assuming that's correct, well then we've got our data stored and then I just need to call the convert acceleration to turn this, um, these values, the X acceleration, Y acceleration bytes into a 14-bit accelerometer value. Okay, here's my convert acceleration function which takes the most significant bit and the least significant bit addresses. <clears throat> uh, the first thing we do is we take the most significant bit address and we go into our data buffer, which is the 128 bits, uh, sorry, 128 bytes that were read in from the registers. And we get the one associated with the most significant bit register. 
Uh, this takes this value and we place it into a short, which means it's, um, it's gonna go into a 16-bit value. We shift it left um, by eight, which puts it into the most significant part. Then we, we or it with the least significant bit address. So this essentially puts the least significant bit into the last, into the least significant eight bits and the most significant bit into the uh, most significant part of the first 16 bits of the short temp. Uh, you remember that the last two bits of the least significant bit of byte are, are, are not used. So we shift the entire number right by two and then we, um, what do we do in the end? What did I do this for? I invert it. Oh, I, I'm, I'm, it's a twos complement number. So therefore I invert it and add one. That's the way we convert from twos complement. And that's my X acceleration value as an integral value. Okay. Uh, the other, the other functions are there. You can look at them in detail if you wish. These are for setting or getting the bandwidth accelerometer values and so on. Again, I'm not certain that this code is perfect. It's work in progress but at least if you're working on this sensor, something like it, you can see the way that I've interacted with it. The I squared C part was the part where I was interacting like this. So if you want to develop code to um, access and read the state, um, use the example that's here, that reads in the values from the, um, reads in the values directly from um, the I squared C bus using this S, using the um, sorry the file open, then the IOCTL, then your your read and then your uh, close the file. To read a, a, an individual byte, where where have I put it? To read a sing or sorry to write uh, to the I squared C device, you have the address and the value that you wish to write. We do pretty much the same thing. We open. Um, just as we did before, we set IOCTL so we can set the I squared C address, uh, which is the zero by 40. And then we set up a buffer of two values. The first value is the address. The second value is the value that we wish to write. And then we call the write to write those values to that location. If we don't, uh, if it doesn't succeed with failure to write, otherwise we, uh, we wrote to it correctly. So it's a little bit different than what you've seen before for working with the GPIOs, but hopefully by using this code example, which as I said, is linked to this particular video, um, hopefully it'll let you try and write code um, for interfacing to any I2C device.